Well, good afternoon. I have been planning this program for many years, so I'm looking forward to it. I consider it getting a group of old friends together and telling them some good stories about people who have been forgotten because of them. And one more thing, some of my friends in the past few months say, you're talking too loud. So if, if I start to over emote, raise your hand or somebody do something, and I will stop blaring. Okay, uh, they say Cosville was founded in 1869 by Colonel Coffee. In the next several, in the next decade or so, there would have been bars, houses of pleasure, and those in the old movies usually have a tinny piano being played in the background. And then in the 80s, there were churches founded, black and white churches, gospel, spirituals, hymns, all through the town. And then in native Indian territory, they were singing or dancing to the music of the centuries. So there was lots of music in Coffeyville. I have no specifics, I have no names, no details, but I'm imagining. Uh, the, I'm going to talk about five forgotten people of Coffeyville who performed or composed on a national stage. And I think all these people should be recognized by the modern day people. The first is Eva Jesse. She was born in Coffeyville in 1895. She wrote an autobiography, Red Carpet and Coal Linoleum. So I assume the Coal Linoleum was in Coffeyville. She went to school in Coffeyville, Iowa, Langston University. Then she started directing choruses, which was the main work of her life. They did jazz, gospels, spirituals, and several kinds of music. In 1929, she went to Hollywood, MGM, for an all-talking picture. That was just when the sound was coming in the movies. It was called Hallelujah. It was an all-black cast, very unusual for Hollywood. I, the director was King Vidor, V-I-D-O-R. He was already successful in silent pictures, and he proved he could do a talking picture. So he became one of the great directors. I've spent my life reading about movie directors, so he's one of the best. I have recently read Miss Jessie and King Vidor did not always get along on racial matters, but the movie was made, it was a landmark. It's there to see, I've never seen it. It's not on video to my knowledge. Now, in the 30s she went to Broadway, did some great shows. Her greatest credit was Porgy and Bass, the original production. She directed the chorus alongside working with George Gershwin. She did many productions of Porgy over the years. In 1963, she was the official choral director for the March on Washington, led by Martin Luther King. So she never gave up music and fighting for what she thought was right. I never met her, I must admit, but I did talk to her on the telephone. In the early or middle 80s, I got this bug about bringing people back. Uh, some of you who are around may remember a mall of the night visitors with David Evans and James Tasca. And I wanted to get Eva Jesse here for a tribute. So I, she had lived in Pittsburgh, Kansas. I thought, that would be easy, just go over and get her. Well, in the meantime, she moved to Ann Arbor, Michigan. <laughs> True. And that's where she lived the rest of her life. But I did talk to her. I explained the whole thing. The first thing out of her mouth was, somebody's going to have to come up with a lot of money for that to happen. That's true. And so our, our conversation kind of drifted on, and uh, it never happened, as you well know. Uh, it would have been great. It should have happened, but it never did. Uh, the next honoree is Oscar Stover. 
The fact is, I have no information about his birth and childhood. My helpers, Francis Fitzgerald Kreiner and uh, uh, Miss Isham Barrett, they didn't give me any information. I do know he came and started teaching Coffeyville schools in 1935. He taught here for some years. He went, taught at Pittsburgh State. He served in the armed forces during World War II. In 47, he got a doctorate in Michigan. Then he came back to Coffeyville and taught in all the schools here, for, including the junior college, for years. In 1960, he got a job at Northwestern State University in Alva, Oklahoma, as director of the bands and the whole music program. I, the best memory I have of him was the mid-60s. Vic Cox, some of you remember, was superintendent of schools, and he was retiring. Oscar and Catherine Stover came to our house at 108 Welke, and there were a lot of city leaders there that night. And Oscar was asked to pick out a theme music for each of the guests who was going to pay tribute to Vic Cox at the Morrill Hall the next day. He was able, when he told the profession of the, uh, of the guest, to pick out a popular song on the piano with no music and almost no preparation. I thought, this man knows his music. Now the next honoree, Gail Kubik, G-A-I-L-K-U-B-I-K. Most of you probably don't know him. He had a huge resume. He was born in South Coffeyville in 1913, and he and my father graduated from Field Kidley in 1931 the first class to graduate in, from Field Kinley. He uh, had an amazing career. In the war years, he wrote music scores for propaganda and training films for the Army. After the war, he worked for NBC Radio. In 1950, he went to Hollywood and wrote the score for an animated cartoon called Gerald McBoing Boy. Does anybody remember that? Okay. So that cartoon won the Oscar for the best animated cartoon of 1950. And we have a DVD of it. It will be playing on the television in Hospitality Hall after the program. So I hope you can just take a little gander at it and see what it's like. It's a very innovative cartoon, not, not like Disney or Looney Tunes. It was a different style. All right. In 1952, he won the Pulitzer Prize for Music. And I don't believe anybody else in Coffeyville natives has won a Pulitzer for anything. And he's almost forgotten. This man should be remembered, promoted in museums, in the schools, and along with all my honorees. This pe these people should not be forgotten. He wrote many scores for movies in the 50s. What, the best one I have read of was called The Desperate Hours, starring Humphrey Bogart and Frederick Marsh. And it was directed by William Wyler, who was one of the great movie directors of Hollywood. He directed everything from Mrs. Menever to Ben-Hur. He had a great range. So uh, Gail worked with many great people along the way. He continued composing and conducting. In 1981, he came to the 50-year reunion of the class of 31. So I went to the party, and I got to meet him. He was very nice, down to earth, easy to talk to. Honestly, I don't remember what we said. I was so impressed by all of his accomplishments. But he died a few later, years later, I heard. But he was one who should be remembered. The next, the fourth honoree, Ruby Jane Douglas White. She dropped her name Ruby when she went to New York. But I always call her Ruby Jane, because that's what mother called her. They were great friends. She was born at 615 Lincoln in 1919. She did a variety of things in the East. Does anybody remember Name That Tune in the 50s, the game show? 
She worked on that. She played piano for at least one off-Broadway show. She and her husband, Gail White, ran a summer music theater in New Jersey for a few years. And in 1966, my parents, John Gillespie, my good friend, and I found that theater. It was way in the wild, but we saw the King and I. Very nice production, and we had a good talk. So she and Gail White, her husband, both developed a serious cancer problem. They were eventually healed, and Ruby Jane turned to Christian music, and she did that for the rest of her life. The last time I saw her was maybe 84, and she and Gail came to our house, had a good visit, reminiscing. And then she said, I got you a song ready for the banquet tonight. And she sat down at the piano. I believe she was playing a song she had never played before and saying words she had never sung before. And I thought, this woman is a genius. So, all right, the last of my honorees, number five, is James Tasca, who was one of the best friends of my life. Our relationship was not physical or sexual. It was musical and laughable. We had a lot of jokes about the t town and the school, and we did a lot of laughing together. And I think I was the right accompanist at that time. He went way ahead of me in later years, but at, in high school we were a good team. In August of 68, I was getting ready to go to Boston University for what was expected to be a great academic career. Uh, James came to my father and said, I want to go to Boston with Kenny. This was a complete shock to all of us. I'd never thought of such a thing. My dad said, well, I will call Ed, sorry, just a minute, Ed Stein. He is the Dean of Fine Arts at Boston University, and he's from Coffeyville. I said, that was another shock. I had no idea of that man. I didn't know anything about him. But he called Stein. We ended up sending a record of James Boyce to uh, Mr. Stein. He calls up and said, this boy has some talent. I, I'm out of scholarships for this year. But if you can get him in the, this freshman year, I can get him a scholarship next year. So my dad went to several of his business and friends, and each of them, including my dad, put up several hundred dollars as a loan to the Tyasca family. This was not a grant. One woman in Boston said, it should have been a grant. Well, we did not do that. It was a loan, and the Tyaskas paid all the men back. So James and I went off to Boston. I'm going to skip a whole lot of material in years. The train ride we took to Boston from Cherryvale, I could talk a half hour about that. It was crazy. Anyway, May 1983, Radio City Music Hall in New York, Porgy and Beth, great orchestra, great set, great cast, huge audience, thousands of people filling the place, and that Gershwin music. I could not get it out of my head for months afterwards. The songs and underscore, they just all kept playing through my mind. It was so good. That was one of the best scores ever written for opera or musical comedy, whatever you want to call it, for in bed. Brenda Shivers and her husband, Richard Harlan, and I were in third row center, great seats. And of course, James was Porgy. I will tell you, he was superb as an actor and as a singer. I had to cry a little. Just a minute. Richard, forgive me. But I thought, well, all the work and hoop to do was worth it. He has become a great artist. Enough said on those five people. Now, those of us who lived through the 1950s will remember that the popular music started to change. The parlor piano had been the instrument of choice for all of the homes. Suddenly, the guitars started coming in. Uh, my brother 
was bringing on 45 RPM records with names like Elvis and Jerry Lee. And uh, people were starting to listen to this new kind of rock music. My babysitter, Frances Fitzgerald, I like to go through her purse and look at her wallet, that's true. And I found this little card that said, fan club, Rodney right in the Blazers, with a picture of these guys. I said, who in the world are these people? Well, over the next decade, they made their name, and everybody knew them. Later, Rodney Lay be became his name for the Wild West, and they toured with Roy Clark for many years all over the country, maybe in the world, I don't know. He is now retired near Lenapaw, Oklahoma, but he was one of the first rock and roll heroes of Coffeyville. I'm going to mention another name, Donnie Miller. Now, he has always drawn a big audience, even though he doesn't live here anymore. He still gets the Coffeyville people out to his shows. Then I want to mention a band called House of Rising Suns, and they were very popular in the six, late 60s, and at our 40 year, my 40-year reunion in 2008, they played at Caesars Club, and my class went wild over them. And Janet Ford, my lifelong friend, made me dance with her to that music. <laughs> so uh, the music changed. Rhythm and blues, soul, country and western, heavy metal, hip hop, rap, and all the different permutations through the decades. So we, you have your favorite time, and I hope you have good memories. Now, uh, this has gone faster than I thought. Uh, I can keep talking, keep talking. Uh, I want to talk about some of the people who remained here in Coffeyville all their lives teaching music to the students, including some of these talented people I've already mentioned. First, Corrine Dick. Do anybody remember her? She was at the junior high, vocal music many years. She directed the Sing and Swing show in the spring. I played for it in the ninth grade. Our dress, first show was a shambles, I must say, but the next two nights it got together. And, and she taught James Tesca music in his senior year, and I was a player, piano player. So putting Corrine and James in the same room was two strong personalities clashing. But I just kept quiet and played the piano. So that was that. Now, the Benefields, Jim, Winifred, and Barbara, a musical family. The parents loved opera, classical music, sacred music. My dad and other people have told me that at the junior high, Jim was a terribly tough principal for many years and that he really wouldn't let any fooling around go on in his school. But here at church, he was always kindly and friendly when I was a boy. I used to sing in the church choir, and I would lean on Jim and Bob Graham for my tenor note. I was not a good part singer, so I don't sing in the choir anymore. But they were a big help to me. A Barbara ended, not ended, but she went later to Tulsa and played regularly at the Boston Avenue Methodist Church. So they were a talented family. Harvey Lewis, he was band director at the high school for many years and also led the drum corps. He was the music director for our choir it was up in this sanctuary for many years. Bob Partridge was the junior high band director. And uh, I, re I tried to take clarinets in about 1960 or 61. I was terrible. I said, get me back to the piano. So that's what I did. Uh, Henry and Faye Mellon. I think I remember their first day in Coffeyville. They performed at this church as new musicians. Bob and Marge, uh, Bill and Marge Nelson had just left. So they played in this church, in other churches, in schools, in the Bartlesville Symphony, and in many pit orchestras for the musical. Henry has 
betrayed the secret. But they are still playing, I believe. And then Delcina Stevenson. Now she's a great professor. She was a uh, daughter of Mrs. Berthina Guest. She became a leading singer in opera and concert. I went to L.A. in 1986, my last trip out there, to see Picnic by William Inns at the Amundsen Theater with an all-star cast. I looked in the L.A. Times, says Delcina Stevenson, will perform with the South Southern California Youth Symphony at UCLA, Sunday night, free. So I said, I gotta get there. I did, I found Royce Hall, and I met her, and asked her to come back that Christmas and sing with Edith and Tiaska in Among the Night Visitors. So we thought perhaps. She sent us a letter later saying her voice was not right for that part. So I never got her back here for one of our shows. But she was, I believe she's still alive, living in Europe, as far as I know. Another classmate of hers named Maimon Morrison was a great classical pianist. I heard him give a recital in 1968, just after I graduated. I haven't been able to find any other information about him. I'm not sure if he's even alive. Uh, but uh, he was a Coffeyville product, and he had a great talent, and he pursued it. Then the choir years. I wrote a column about this. I hope some of you are reading that column in the newspaper. But uh, in high school, I had three choir directors in three years. Lane Broadstreet, Jim Criswell, and Gary Gray. I loved them all, and they liked me. And I, that was one of my happiest times, to be playing for the choir and the magicals and the cavalcade and Tesca's appearances. I was so busy, I didn't have time to study. And in math and physics that last semester, Eloise Eckhart and Bill Lynn socked it to me on the grade card. But they said I was a valedictorian. I really wasn't. But, but I'll take it. John Gillespie, I say, was the valedictorian. He, he was a great student at that time. Of the piano teachers of Coffeyville, there were many of them in my youth and born back to mother's youth. She studied with a woman, Ada Bell Morris, in the 1920s. And she said Ada Bell was mean to her. So when my time in the 50s came, she said, I'm not going to send you to Ada Bell Morris. She sent me to Jessie Clark, who was a wonderful woman, perhaps somewhat eccentric, perhaps so am I, but we fed each other. We were together 11 years, and she was a wonderful teacher and a very nice person. So there were many others. I can't tell you all the names. You probably have your favorite, but be proud of all those teachers. Now, that's all the names I'm going to mention. I want to mention the community concerts. They were in independence for some years, and Mr. Benefield was their agent in Coffeyville. Then Kenneth Birchnall, whatever happened, I did it, he presented community con concerts with his arts council here in Coffeyville. Brought in some classical musicians and some big band musicians. So I'm sorry those are no longer in existence. They were great treat to music lovers, but the crowds, unfortunately, got smaller and smaller. It's a shame. Also want to mention the city band. It's still going. It was formed in 1896, I'm told. And it's every Friday night in summer, they perform on the plaza or at the Midland, and Tony Fraser's the leader. He also directs a choir here in this church. So, that is one group that has kept its talent moving. The Matinee Musical, does anybody remember that? Well, they were a group of ladies who pr promoted and performed music for many years in Coffeyville. And like almost all the ladies' clubs and some of the men's clubs, they just ran out of existence, which is an unfortunate thing. We've lost a lot of population. We've lost a lot of good 
talented people caught him being one. And uh, so that she's no longer, those, those ladies are no longer with us. And performing. <laughs> uh, I, here it is, 2.32, and I'm ready to close. What do you think of that? <laughs> I'm going to mention one more name. Uh, a classmate of mine, a class of 68, Mike Miesky. He was a fine pianist in high school. And then, as I understand it, he completely gave up piano for many years. And then, in the past decade, he studied piano. He's giving recitals of his own compositions. He's also published several historical novels under the pen name V.S. Alexander. So for him, the sky is the limit. So, I do intend to give another lecture next year on the history of theater in Coffeyville. Now, down the hall, what we call hospitality hall, just out that door and down, we have three sheet cakes from Sunflower Soda Fountain, white, chocolate, lemon. We have soft drinks and coffee. And I want to greet all of you personally. So I hope you'll all come down and have a snack with us. So I guess that's all I can say. I'll just say thank you for one of the best days of my life. Goodbye.